It's day 84! This would normally be the day that we kick the seniors out the door! Yeah, that rhymes. Uh, my target today is for you to figure out. Um, you have now spent nine months-ish with a complete stranger. And some of you have truly suffered and actually spent 18 months with a stranger than strange stranger because you've been in my classes, chemistry and AP bio. Those are the ones that truly suffered. Um, so in all that time, of course, we've learned a lot of science and hopefully some other things. And I wanted to see if you could actually figure out what are the three things that I hope you take away from my AP biology class. So pause me, get out your ETD, See if you can figure out what do you think of the three main things I was hoping you'd take away, because there's a lot that we learned this year, right? Cool. Uh, usually by now, most kids can figure out. Um, I've done some horrible singing, made some really bad jokes, made you draw a lot of pictures. And that's because, of course, one of the main themes is Anytime you want to tackle anything that's difficult to, to learn or understand, you can always use my tool, which is SCAR, right? You can take complex ideas, you can simplify them, you can connect them with very simple cartoons to draw the picture because you're a visual creature, all humans are, huge exhibit alone, right? Visual reason. You can use the most powerful thing ever. It's the way that you learn language. It's the way that you learn how to write. It's called analogies, right? Something is like something else. You think about what it's like, that traps it and sticks it in with all your former synaptic connections and increases your chances of recalling it. And then you got to have reconnects. You got to have things that help you remember multiple things, right? So hopefully we've scarred you for life inside your brain so that when you see something like a penguin, you're like, stupid penguin. Who walks around in a tuxedo every day? But, you know, you're like, well, he doesn't have to be that intelligent because he just has to be smart enough to find, you know, to survive and reproduce. That's the test of his fitness. And of course, they're not stupid. They're as smart as they need to be, and they are geniuses in surviving in environments that would kill us rapidly, right? They can even fly underwater. But look at those happy feet. Oh, penguins. The other part of this, of course, is how you actually access all that knowledge. Uh, um, a lot of kids write me back from college and like, Mr. Neal, I hated Scar when I was in your class because you made us do it every day. And now I use it in college and medical school and it works. It's almost like it's based on how your brain works of establishing connections of things that you already know by drawing pictures of it and thinking about what it reminds you of, right? So use what works for your brain. Give it to it, right? Don't worry, it'll grow on you. I use it, so I know all this stuff, right? But you can't learn anything if you don't have that most crucial thing that's inside of all of us when we're born. And that is, of course, why I reward students who ask questions in my class. The, this true test of genius and the source of all knowledge and wisdom is curiosity. So I encourage you to stay curious throughout your life. You were born as a beautiful, curious creature. All humans are. And then unfortunately, some people along the way, they lose that and they become an adult. And they lose the wonder of the world of, why is the sky blue? Why does ice cream taste the way it does? Why, why, why is sugar sticky? Why does this gecko's eye look the way it does? I mean, it looks like a curtain. And if you wonder about those things, well, then you're more likely to go after those and understand them like a true scientist and a human being, right? It's our curiosity and imagination that set us apart as our most beautiful adaptations if we only use them. I mean, this gecko, of course, which is the whole reason why they call it a gecko. It's a large gecko from Thailand, and in the nighttime, you can hear it go, gecko. It doesn't just sell car insurance, right? Quaggy, look at that gecko. It's because, of course, uh, he's a nocturnal creature, and this giant, of course, pupil opens up like a curtain so that it can see at night far better than we can with even starlight cameras. Pretty impressive, right? I mean, his eye's so big, he can't even blink it. He has to clean it with his tongue. That's adaptation, right? Explain the colors. Now, there's another thing to wonder about, right? That, of course, will enrich your life because you were born curious. If you stay curious, I guarantee you, life will be far more interesting.
You will see more wonder and beauty in the world every day of your life if you continue to wonder the whys and the hows, right? Remain the child that's inside of you. Curiosity is there. Stay curious, right? So it's usually at this point of the year, the very last day of the seniors, that I award out the Golden Woodchuck Awards, which goes out to the students in each class and overall that ask the most great questions in class, what I call GQs, right? And those are the kids that had the guts to ask the whys and hows of how the universe works, right? Why do birds smell? Why are boogers green? All that great stuff, right? And the student in fourth period that had the most great questions was Nick Olson. Way to go, Nick. And if we look at this, of course, he asked uh, 21 great questions, not too shabby. In fifth period, it was Ava Stanton. Congratulations, Ava. She rocked up uh, 14 great questions, which is pretty nice showing. This year's a little different because of remote learning. We usually get much higher numbers than we got this year because we're in class together. And that kind of generates a lot of curiosity, especially with silly things that I do or questions I ask you guys. But we're going to go with what we got. Um, I did want to make sure that everybody was aware that a world record for great questions total was awarded this year to Devin Dyeron. He is the all-time platinum goldenest golden woodchuck winner of all. Devin racked up in two years of uh, chemistry and AP bio consecutively, 240 great questions. He finally beat Lydia. <laughs> so a little shout out to you guys. Congratulations. You are the Golden Woodchucks of 2020 and the all-time Golden Woodchuck winner. Well done, Devin. Now, and included with that, the end of our year has focused not only what the AP exam needs, which is way too easy, so then we went after the stuff that matters. It was mostly focused on ecology. And you did your Eco Issues Project, and you're going to be presenting them um, via your videos this week. Normally, we do it in class and to the public and all those things, and I encourage you to continue to do that to the public. And hopefully, you figured out a crucial thing. All of those Eco Projects was focused on our home. It was our Home Issues Project, and that's what, of course, we should think of it as. It's our only home. Now, our species has existed for most 2 million years now, they're saying. As a modern species, likely 100,000 years and 10,000 years for this, you know, thing that had figured out farming. And in that time, we've come to dominate the earth as a, a single species more than any other species has. So essentially the fate of the earth is cheesily and literally in the palm of our hands. I got the whole world in our hands. Yeah, kind of scary. If you're any of the other creatures and you paid attention to any of these eco projects. So usually at this point of the year, uh, my students ask a very intelligent question, which everybody should ask. Okay, we found out all these horrible things that we're doing to our home, planet Earth, the only place in the universe that we know of that we can exist, the only place that can support us and give us the water, the oxygen, the food, the right amount of energy, the right temperature. It's got everything right that we need. So obviously we're doing a pretty good job of messing all that up, right? Every eco issue, of course, showed connections to humans and our choices and the destruction of the natural ecosystems that keep us afloat as a species and all the other species. So they always ask the same question. Mr. Neil, do you think, can we save the earth? So I want to ask you that. Can we save the earth? Well, let's take a look and think about this, right? One thing that we definitely have changed is our population, and our population has changed its desire for energy. Throughout most of our history, of course, energy was pretty hard to come by. You got it from your food. And then we figured out this thing called fire, and then we eventually tapped in during the Industrial Revolution this idea that you could use combustion to drive machines. And by doing that, we intelligently figured out that, well, I can access a lot of energy from like old dead algae and swamps coal and oil, right? And I can combust that inside of a combustion chamber and drive mechanical advantages that allow me to move around the earth much faster, much more, you know, energy efficient for myself. It's easier. You can't blame us. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like a really good deal until you realize, of course, that the thing that comes out of that is when you burn a hydrocarbon, you get <coughs> smoke, CO2 and H2O which are both, unfortunately, powerful greenhouse gases. Second and third only to methane. 
Now, with that in mind, that has caused massive problems for the Earth, pushing up the temperature, changing the climate. And that's all related to, you know, the most important thing. If you, if you want something to happen, well, then you vote for it, right? And hopefully you've gotten the idea that what you buy is what you vote for. So if you want all of the destruction of the Earth to happen faster, buy a giant SUV. Use more energy. Don't think about what you buy. If you want it to die faster and consume the earth, eat red meat, right? That's what you're voting for when you purchase it. Even if you might not check a ballot and say, I want the earth to heat up so that all of the ocean boils up and the coral spit out its zoxanthellae and die off so there's no nursery for the ocean. When you drive that extra drive by yourself to practice without carpooling, that's what you choose, right? So if we look at this, I want to give you one more example. This um, is... An example of what you buy is what you vote for. This is an orangutan, right? His name means uh, the man of the forest, orangutan, right? And I had the fortune of seeing these guys in Borneo a few years ago. And they are one of our closest living relatives. I mean, this baby will live with his mom for anywhere from six to eight years, learning how to actually survive in this forest to move around and find enough fruit to eat. They need massive multi-level forests to find all that food. And I remember meeting one called Pongo that lived right outside of the, the research station that I was staying at. It was pretty awesome to see it in the wild, just doing its thing, you know, building the nest to keep out of uh, the rain that day. And um, this is what Borneo looks like today. It used to be the, the largest tropical island covered with one of the largest tropical forests, rainforests on Earth. But now it doesn't look like a multi-level forest. It looks like this. It's all a monocrop culture. And before that, they have to cut down the forest to put this in. What are those things? Well, flying over Borneo, um, there were some people on, on the plane. They're like, oh, look, it's so green. It's so beautiful. It's green. But that's because it's a plantation. It's a farm. And what it grows is this stuff called palm oil. And palm oil is used in almost every product that you buy. Palm oil is one of those magical chemicals that makes a cheap oil that's very good and has the right consistency and properties to go into food items that doesn't distort its taste but increases its you know, calorie intake as well as how smoothly it goes on the tongue, how well it melts. So we find it in everything from Oreo cookie cream, it's in that white center, right, to Kit Kats, to Ritz crackers, to chocolate products. To top ramen even right mm, top ramen and when you buy these items essentially what you're saying is i want to take the rainforest home of these orangutans and cut it down and plant a plantation now we already did this in north america with our wild systems we already turned them into a bunch of corn and wheat fields but in borneo it's happening right now and when they do it they cut down the forest and they light the scraps on fire because that enriches this poor tropical soil so they can plant all these plantations, right? So when you, of course, do that, you're voting for the burning as well as the destruction of their forest. Now, this is one way to look at it. They lose their forest. This is another way to look at it. This is what happens when that happens. Because the orangs are pushed into such tight little regions, because now like 70% of Borneo has already been cut down. Like you just drove and for hours it was just plantations. The orangs are starving. They're a large primate. They need a lot of room and a lot of forest to find enough fruit that's actually in season because not every tree is in fruit all the time to supply enough nutrients and calories for the body. So what the orangs unfortunately do is to get from these pockets of forest that are there, they have to cross the palm oil plantations or there's only palm oil plantations near them. So they're searching for food and they don't eat the palm oil nuts. But unfortunately, as they make it through the local workers that are on these farms, well, they are afraid that the orangs are going to damage the crop, thereby damaging their income, right? They got to feed their kids too. And so what they do is they set the tree on fire. And when you set the tree on fire, the orang, who's very big and could actually rip your arm off, they're strong, it's stuck up in the tree and it, it doesn't know what to do, so it, it burns to death. And you'll see this one here, not only did it die from, of course, its burns and suffocation, but you can see it's kind of holding its body weirdly because those that do come down, they usually die in little cages. But this one especially was huddled over because it was sheltering its baby. 
And oftentimes when the mother orang dies, she she dies because she's shielding the baby from the flames and she can't climb through the trees quickly to do that. And you can see that with this orang, you can see how emaciated she is because she's in a forest that hasn't a forest anymore. It's turned into a plantation with no food for her and her baby was starving too. I mean, you see this with humans, they'd be considered a, a war crime, right? For us, it's agriculture, right? So if we look at these scenes, of course, those babies eventually end up going into the pet trade. Uh, I got to see these ones at a place called Sepaluk. It's one of the reserves that's trying to return them to the wild, but they have to have a wild to do that. So the good news of this is, is that activists throughout Europe found out about this information and they kept pushing with their parent companies like Nestle, which runs things like Milky Way, and gets into Kit Kats and all that stuff. What they did was they put on a big protest to make them aware that their customers, their people, were not going to buy products that had things that were pulled from palm oil plantations that were unsustainably pulled from nature, right? So that means that those companies, those massive multi-billion dollar companies, like Nestle, they then had to shift their product because their customers knew the true price of palm oil, which was the destruction of a natural habit, habitat, the starvation of the orangutans and the orphaning of their babies, as well as the destruction of all the coral reefs that beautifully surround Borneo that are being damaged by this human choice and all the runoff that comes off. And basically these activist groups showed Nestle and other powerful companies that they weren't going to buy their product. And as soon as the companies like Nestle figured that out, they suddenly switched their suppliers and they switched their suppliers, the ones that had to be confirmed to be palm oil safe in terms of orangutan safe. They are sustainable works in places that are already actually being farmed. They're not expanding out from those things. And that would give the chance that the remaining 30% of rainforest in places like Borneo would be safe. And that'd be pretty cool because these orangs are amazing and they are relatives, very close. And you can see in their eyes, they have intelligence and feelings too. I like that one, yeah. Hmm. So that's just one example. We should notice that that's happened throughout the world. Throughout the last 50 years especially, the accelerated growth of man has meant that there is far less nature and natural places, the places that create fresh water and fresh air and the nutrient cycles that keep us alive. And there's far more people knocking on 8 billion real soon, right? That's sent things massively out of balance. And we can see the effect of all of that on the weather systems, climate systems, and in human conflict. Human conflict has increased as the years have gone by, especially in the last hundred years. You think about all the world wars and continued wars that we're in, right? It's all about resources and overpopulation. So if we look at this, can we save the earth? No. I'm not going to lie to you because I never have. I think that's a waste of time for people. We cannot save the earth. You can notice that the problems that we have created are far too large and we cannot save the earth. But the good news is we don't have to. The earth will be fine. The, the earth has been around, you know. For, you know, it's got its 4.6 billion years. And in that time, it's faced bigger tragedies than humans. I mean, think about the KT extinction event and planet ice ball. I mean, we've had mass extinctions throughout Earth's history and the Earth has been fine because the cool thing is after you kill all that stuff off, at least some bacteria will survive and they can rebound and repopulate the Earth and then adaptive radiation will fill it back in at it. So we don't have to worry about the Earth. It'll be fine for the next 5 billion years until the sun swells up into a red giant and swallows it. So it, it's not the Earth that we have to worry about. It's us. And what that means, of course, is if we think about this, I like to think about it this way. If we had a planet and we got wise, that we figured out that we needed more nature. Some people call it the 50%, where nature gets 50% to make all of our clean water and air and systems. And humans get 50% for all their farming needs and things like that in cities. You would have to have far less people. And some viruses are trying to do that right now. And wars will continually try to do that. But those far less people, if they chose to have less people, smaller families, and that's what happens when people become educated, they tend to have smaller families and they tend to have longer lives. 
and with education, they have a higher income. So they start to become more educated about how to save nature because it saves them. Then we could do a really cool thing. We could have less, but healthier people and a healthier ecosystem full of all this beautiful nature that keeps us alive. So what that means is we could help the earth to save us. And that's really what we have to worry about here. And humans being so selfish, that makes sense that this would be the key thing we need to get across to people. You don't have to worry about saving the earth. You do have to worry about helping the earth save us. And that means you have to help to save all the other plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, all the other ecosystems, living systems, that keep us alive. Because not only do they keep us alive, they're beautiful and they make life far more fascinating and interesting and easier. So ways that we can do that. One, this planet runs on solar energy. Whether it's ancient solar energy like old dead algae or old dead trees called oil and coal, that's still photosynthesis from the past. It just got locked up, but it got locked up during the Carboniferous and we're releasing it at an amazing rate. Instead, we could do what folks like, you know, Elon Musk want to do because he's really smart. And if we look at this, they want to capture current sun energy. That means solar. That means beautiful things like wind turbines, which are still solar because it's about heating convection on the Earth's surface. Or we could look at the movement of water, which is still tied to solar in rivers. Or we could look at tidal action with the moon. Hey, those are all renewable resources, and the sun's going to be around for the rest of Earth's history. Now, this is why visionaries like Elon Musk, and I don't work for him. I'm just giving him a shout out for thinking ahead because it pays to actually think. They put out companies like Solar City as well as Tesla that have figured out how to make batteries that actually store energy efficiently, solar panels that are cheap enough that they compete with fossil fuels, that we could now store the energy individually at your house and there'd be enough to run our entire society without burning any fossil fuels. So we could run on current sun energy and we know how to store it to meet our ever needing, ever growing need for fast, 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 because they've innovated ways to do that, right? This company is doing very, very well it could do much better if more people understood the cost benefit analysis of this. The one thing that we're lacking currently is the best battery design. So if say one of my students or several of my students could work to inventing a new battery, you could not only retire to your own private island, you could help us save ourselves. You could help the earth save us, right? Other things we should recognize is the, the one of the greatest things in nature is trees. Now, we cut down trees to make toilet paper and lots of paper for glass and our buildings and our houses. We build our world on secondaries island, right? Trees. Now, trees do more than just give us oxygen. They hold on to soil. Their roots, the tree underneath, grabs onto that soil, and then most water on Earth actually flows under the surface of the land. And as it flows through, if the roots are there, they grab on to any of the nutrients and the bad stuff and allow bacteria to break it down and decompose it and turn it into soil, so you have rich soil to grow more trees. And what comes out the other end? Some of the purest, cleanest water that you can have. A great example of this would be, say, in our area, where they built this thing called the Cedar River Watershed. And if you just go up from our high school, you can see where there's this giant fence where they don't allow humans. There's no houses. There's no development. It's just a bunch of forest that gets snowed on and rained on. And what it produces with all those trees is some of the cleanest water on Earth. They, they don't even really have to add chlorine to it. They just do it just in case for the lawyers, right? And we can drink it. And it's simple thing is they just allow trees and less people. Now, as soon as you drop below that watershed and start getting into your community, all the parking lots, all the houses, all the toilets, all the businesses, the health of that water, the Cedar River, goes down dramatically until you get to rent it, right? It could be even worse if you go to the rest of the world, like... These guys here in Kenya, this is their drinking water. It's also their toilet, right? But this drinking water is heavily contaminated because unfortunately being rural herders, their goats ate all the trees. They chopped them down for firewood. And some people even in Africa are figuring out, hey, if we don't want all of Africa to turn into a giant desert, desertification, the spreading of the Sahara, then we need to plant trees so that termites can come in and create holes to let moisture in, and then of course it can come back and we get cleaner water out of that. 
So the next time that you go for a nice drink or you wash your car with the purest water on earth, think of these guys and how lucky you are. And maybe you should preserve that stuff because this is loaded with parasites. And that's why his life expectancy will be much shorter than yours. Right? That's why he might get a, a liver fluke that eats away at his system or a worm in his eye that actually makes him blind. Man, we should actually like appreciate what we have and take care of it and maybe spread that to the other parts of the world so they're not suffering as well, right? Biggest thing you could do of all, you could eat less red meat. If you weren't going to do anything but that, that would have one of the biggest factors of all because that takes up more land mass, more CO2, more fuel goes into this and CO2 comes out of it and methane coming out of their waste than anything else. Biggest challenge, cut it out completely. I can say that because I've done it, right? Or if you're going to eat less meat, period, that would be awesome. Maybe just one day a week you don't eat meat, right? I mean, I, I only eat meat what, four days a week, and it's usually only for one meal because you need some protein in your diet. I tip my hat to those vegans. That would save the rest of us. So switch your diet further down the energy pyramid, and you're far less wasteful, right? But cut out red meat, and you'd be the, doing the biggest simple thing you can ever do because you don't need it to survive, right? Hopefully you recognize that what you buy is what you vote for. If you, if you want nature to die faster, then just buy more, right? The more you buy, the faster nature dies. Or the less you buy, the better nature survives, right? And nature, of course, allows our survival. Ultimately, it's our choice to help the earth save us. Because what they've seen in places like New Zealand is if you block off an area of an island that was depleted by fishing and you block it off so people can't fish it within just a couple of years, it was flourishing with fish because they created a Marine reserve. Maybe we should create giant Marine reserves in the ocean so that we can replenish the ocean because nature can come back. If you give it a chance, it evolved to do that. It's been through climate change before, but not at this rate. This time it's our fault. Science has proven that 100%. Anybody who does not actually recognize that doesn't understand or is deluding themselves. This is our chance and your chance especially. My generation and the generations before me have failed. And this is your future. Take it. Change the way that we do things. Spread the word of how we do things. And maybe we can help the earth to save us. That would be awesome, right? Now, that is the end of AP Bio in terms of required ETDs. There will be more, of course, on my YouTube channel. Check out the Neil Science Field. You just type in Jonathan Neil, and there's lots of horrible songs that will be with that. Some of them chem, some of them bio, some of them physics. More of that coming so you can, you know, when you're bored at college, you can be like, hey, oh, man, yeah, it was, that was a trip, right? My uh, homework for you is to hug a tree and say thanks for the bee. And as you hug it, of course, and you breathe in that sweet oxygen and you think about the water that came through its root system so that you could fill up your cells, realize that tree does not like you very much. So it might try to stick you in the eye because they don't need us. They do both photosynthesis and respiration, but we need them. So maybe we should have a few more of them, right? And then my challenge to you is to scar yourself for life. That doesn't mean making the scar charts and stuff. Just when you see something in the world, wonder about it. And then as you're figuring out something like oxidative phosphorylation, go, yeah, hey, that's just like a hydroelectric dam. Or, yeah, nerves, they're like salty bananas. And it'll make a lot more sense if you connect to those things because that's how advertising works too. And I'm hoping that this will advertise the idea that we really need to help the earth to save us by making wiser decisions. And that can start with you. If you don't start making wiser decisions, nobody else is. So you have to be that change. I'm trying to do my part. My challenge is to you. Thank you for an excellent year. Good luck in all of your adventures.